are playing a game. And the game runs like this. The only thing you really know is what you can put into words. Let's suppose I love some girl, rapturously. And somebody says to me, would you really love her? Well, how am I going to prove this? Well, say, uh, write poetry. Tell us all how much you love her, then we will believe you. So if I'm an artist and I can put this into words and convince everybody that I've written the most ecstatic love letters ever written, they say, all right, okay, we, we'll admit it, you really do love her. But supposing you're not very articulate, are we going to tell you you don't love her? Surely not. You don't have to be Heloise and Abelard to be in love. So the whole game that our culture is playing is that nothing really happens unless it's in the newspaper. So we're, when we are at a party and there's a great party, somebody said, it's too bad there wasn't a tape recorder. And so our children begin to feel that they don't exist authentically unless they get their names in the papers. And the fastest way of getting your name in the papers is to commit a crime. And then you'll be photographed, then you'll appear in court, and everybody will notice you. It really happened if it was recorded. In other words, if you shout and it doesn't, doesn't come back an echo, it didn't happen. Well, that's a real hang-up. It's true, the fun with echoes. We all like singing in the bathtub because there's more resonance there. And when we play a musical instrument like a violin or a cello, it has a sounding box because that gives resonance to the sound. And in the same way, the cortex of the human brain enables us when we are happy to know that we are happy. And that gives a certain resonance to it. If you're happy and you don't know you're happy, there's nobody home. But this is the whole problem for us. Several thousand years ago, human beings evolved the system of self-consciousness. And uh, they knew, they, they knew. There was a young man who said, though, it seems that I know that I know. What I would like to see is the eye that knows me when I know that I know that I know. You see? And, and this is uh, the human problem. We know that we know. And so there came a point in our evolution when we didn't guide life by just trusting our instincts and had to think about it and had to purposely arrange and discipline and push our lives around in accordance with foresight and words and systems of symbols, accountancy, calculation, and so on. And then we worry. Once you start thinking about things, you worry as to whether you've thought enough. Did you really take all the details into consideration? Was every fact properly reviewed? And by Jove, the more you think about it, the more you realize that uh, you really couldn't take everything into consideration because all the variables in any human decision are incalculable. So you get anxiety. And this, though, also, this is the price you pay for knowing that you know, for being able to think about thinking, to feel about feeling. And so you're in this funny position. Now then, do you see that this is simultaneously an advantage and a terrible disadvantage? What has happened here is that by having a certain kind of consciousness, a certain kind of reflexive consciousness, being aware of being aware, being able to represent what goes on fundamentally in terms of a system of symbols, such as words, such as numbers. You put, as it were, two lives together at once, one representing the other the symbols representing the reality, the money representing the wealth. And if you don't realize 
that the symbol is really secondary. It doesn't have the same value. You know, people go to the supermarket and they uh, get a whole cartload of goodies and they drive it through. And then the clerk fixes up the counter and this long tape comes out. And you say, $30, please. And everybody feels depressed. Because they, they give away $30 worth of paper, but they've got a cartload of goodies. And they don't think about that. They think they just lost, lost $30. But you've got the real wealth in the cart. All you parted with was the paper. Because the paper in our system becomes more valuable than the wealth. It represents power, potentiality. Whereas the wealth, you think, oh well, that's just necessary. You've got to eat. I mean, that's to be really mixed up. So then, if you awaken from this illusion and you understand that black implies white, self implies other, life implies death, or shall I say, death implies life, You can feel yourself, not as a stranger in the world, not as something here on probation, not as something that has arrived here by fluke, but you can begin to feel your own existence as absolutely fundamental. What you are basically, deep, deep down, far, far in, is simply the fabric and structure of existence itself. So, say in Hindu mythology, they say that the world is the drama of God. God is not something in Hindu mythology with a white beard that sits on a throne and that has royal prerogatives. God in, in Indian mythology is the self, Satchitananda, which means Sat, that which is, Chit, that which is consciousness, that which is Ananda is bliss. And in other words, re, the, the, what exists, reality itself, is gorgeous. It is the plenum, the fullness of total joy. Wow, we. And all those stars, if you look out in the sky, as a firework display like you see on the 4th of July, which is a great occasion for celebration. The universe is a celebration. It is a firework show to celebrate that existence is. Wow, we. And then they say, but however, there's no point just in sustaining bliss. Well, something is going to happen to me that I don't know what it's going to be. And uh, you, you would dig that and come out of that and say, wow, that was a, a close shave, wasn't it? And then you would get more and more adventurous and you would make further and further out gambles as to what you would dream. And finally, you would dream where you are now. You would dream the dream of living the life that you are actually living today. That would be within the infinite multiplicity of choices you would have, of playing that you weren't God. Because the whole nature of the God, according to this idea, is to play that he's not. The first thing he says to himself is, man, get lost. Because he gives himself away. The nature of love is self-abandonment not clinging to oneself, throwing yourself out, as in, for example, in basketball, you're always getting rid of the ball. You say to the other fellow, have a ball, see? And uh, that, that keeps things moving. That's the nature of life. So in this idea then, everybody is fundamentally the ultimate reality, not God in a 
politically kingly sense, but God in the sense of being the self, the deep down basic whatever there is. And you're all that, only you're pretending you're not. And it's perfectly okay to pretend you're not, to be absolutely convinced, because this is the whole notion of drama. When you come into the theater, there is a proscenium arch and a stage, and down there is the audience. And everybody assumes their seats in the theater and uh, are going to see a comedy, a tragedy, a thriller, or whatever it is. And they all know, as they come in and pay their admissions, that what is going to happen on the stage is not for real. But the actors have a conspiracy against this because they're going to try and persuade the audience that what is happening on the stage is for real. They want to get everybody sitting on the edge of their chairs. They want to get you terrified or crying or laughing. Ab absolutely captivated by the drama. And if a skillful human actor can take in an audience and make people cry, think what the cosmic actor can do. Why, he can take himself in completely. He can play so much for real that he really believes it is. Like you sitting in this room, you think you're really here. Why, you've persuaded yourself that way. You've acted it so damn well that you know this is the real world. But you're playing it. It's because the audience and the actor is one. Because behind the stage, there's the green room. Off-scene, obscene, where the actors take off their masks. Do you know that the word person means mask? The persona, which is the mask worn by actors in Greco-Roman drama, because it has a megaphone-type mouth which throws the sound out in an open-air theater. So pair through, sona, what the sound comes through, that's the mask. How to be a real person? How to be a genuine fake, a mask. So the dramatis personae at the beginning of a play is the list of masks that the actors will wear. And so in the course of forgetting that this, this life is a drama, the word for the role, the word for the mask has come to mean who you are genuinely, the person, the proper person. Incidentally, the word parson is derived from the word person. <laughs> person of the village. Person around town, the parson. It's funny. So anyway then, this is a drama. I'm not trying to sell you on this idea in the sense of converting you to it. I want you to play with it. I want you to think of its possibilities. I'm not trying to prove it. I'm just putting it forward as a possibility of life to think about. So then, this means that you're not victims of a scheme of things, of a mechanical world or of an autocratic God. The life you're living is what you have put yourself into. Only you don't admit it because you want to play the game that it's happened to you. In other words, I got mixed up in this world. My parents, I had a father who got hot pants over a girl and she was my mother. And uh, because he got, the, he, was just a, he was just a horny old man. And as a result of that, I got born. And I blame him for it and say, well, that's your fault. You've got to look after me. And he says, I don't see why I should look after you. You're just a result. <laughs> and... But let's suppose we admit that I really wanted to get born and that I was the ugly gleam in my father's eye when he approached my mother. That was me. I was desire. And I deliberately got involved in this thing. Look at it that way instead. And that even if I got myself into an awful mess, and I got born with syphilis and the great Siberian itch and tuberculosis and uh, in a Nazi concentration camp. Nevertheless, this was a game which was a very far out play. It was a kind of cosmic masochism. But I didn't.
Isn't that an optimal game rule for life? Because if you play life on the supposition that you're a helpless little puppet that got involved, or if you play it on the supposition that it's a, a frightful, serious risk and that we really ought to do something about it and uh, so on, it's a drag. There's no point in going on living unless we make the assumption that the situation of life is optimal. That really and truly we are all in a state of total bliss and delight. But we are going to pretend we aren't just for kicks. You play non-bliss in order to be able to experience bliss. And you can go as far out as non-bliss as you want to go. And when you wake up, it'll be great. You know, you can slam yourself on the head with a hammer because it's so nice when you stop. And it makes you realize, you see, how, how great things are when you forget that that's the way it is. And that's just like black and white. You don't know black unless you know white. You don't know white unless you know black. This is simply fundamental. So then, here's the drama. My metaphysics, let me be perfectly frank with you, are that there is the central self. You can call it God, you can call it anything you like. And it's all of us. It's playing all the parts of all beings whatsoever, everywhere and anywhere. And it's playing the game of hide and seek with itself. It gets lost, it gets involved in the farthest out adventures, but in the end, it always wakes up and comes back to itself. And when you're ready to wake up, you're going to wake up. And if you're not ready, you're going to stay pretending that you're just a little, poor little me. And uh, since you're all here and engaged in this sort of inquiry and listening to this sort of lecture, I assume that you're all on the process of waking up. Or else you're teasing yourselves with some kind of uh, flirtation with waking up, which you're not serious about. But I assume yeah, maybe you are not serious but sincere, that you are ready to wake up. So then, when you're in the way of waking up and finding out who you really are, you meet a character called a guru. As the Hindus say this word, the teacher, the awakener. And what is the function of a guru? He's the man who looks at you in the eye and says, oh, come off it. <laughs> I know who you are. You know, you come to the guru and say, sir, I have a problem. I'm unhappy and I want to get one up on the universe or I want to become enlightened. I want spiritual wisdom. Ah, the guru looks at you and says, who are you? You know Sri Ramana Maharshi, that great Hindu sage of modern times? People used to come to him and say, Master, who was I in my last incarnation? As if that mattered. And he would say, who is asking the question? And he'd look at you and say, Basically, go right down to it. You're looking at me, you're looking out, and you're unaware of what's behind your eyes. Go back in and find out who you are, where the question comes from, why you ask. And if you've looked at a photograph of that man, I have a gorgeous photograph of him. And you look in those, I walk by it every time I go out of the front door. And I look at those eyes, and the humor, lilting laugh. Oh, come off it. <laughs> Shiva, I recognize you. When you come to my door and you say, I'm so and so, I say, ha ha, what a funny way God has come on today. <laughs> uh, there are all sorts of tricks, of course, that gurus play. They uh, say, well, we're going to put you through the mill. And the reason they do that is simply that you won't wake up until you feel you've paid a price for it. In other words, the sense of guilt that one has, or the sense of anxiety, is simply 
the way one experiences keeping the game of disguise going on. Do you see that? Supposing you say, I feel guilty. Christianity makes you feel guilty for existing. That somehow, the very fact that you exist is an affront. You are a fallen human being. I remember as a child when we went to the services of the church on Good Friday, they gave us each a colored postcard with Jesus crucified on it. And it said underneath, this have I done for thee, what doest thou for me? You know, you fell off. You nailed that man to the cross. Because you eat steak, you have crucified Christ. Because you killed the bull, after all, you depend on it. Mithra, it's the same mystery. And what are you going to do about that? This have I done for thee, what do thou for me? You feel awful that you just exist at all. But that sense, that sense of guilt is the veil across the sanctuary. Don't you dare come in. In order to, you know, in all mysteries, when you're going to be initiated, there's somebody saying, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, don't you come in. You've got to fulfill this requirement, this requirement, this requirement, this requirement, then we'll let you in. So you go, you, you go through the mill. Why? Because this is, you are saying to yourself, I won't wake up until I feel I deserve it. I won't wake up until I've made it difficult for me to wake up. So I, I, I invent for myself an elaborate system of delaying my waking up. I put myself through this test and that test, and when I feel it's been sufficiently arduous, then I may at last admit to myself who I really am and draw aside the veil and realize that after all, when all is said and done, I am that I am, which is the name of God. And when it comes to it, that's really rather funny. They say in Zen, when you attain Satori, nothing is left to you at that moment but to have a good laugh. But naturally, uh, all masters, Zen masters, yoga masters, every kind of master, uh, puts up a barrier and says to you, He simply plays your own game. You know, we say anybody who goes to a psychiatrist ought to have his head examined. Because you, when you go to a psychiatrist, you define yourself as somebody who ought to have his head examined. Same way, uh, the Zen masters say anybody who studies Zen or comes to a Zen master ought to be given 30 blows with a stick. Because he was stupid enough to pose the question, that he had a problem. But you're the problem. You, you put yourself in this situation. So it's a question fundamentally. Do you define yourself as a victim of the world or as the world? You can define yourself. You see, if you identify you with what you call the voluntary system of the nerves, and say, only that's me. And that's really a rather limited amount of my total performance, what I do voluntarily. Then you've defined yourself as the victim in the game. And so you are able to feel that life was a trap. Something else, whether it was God or whether it was fate or whether it was uh, the big mechanism, the system, imposed this on you. And you can say, poor little me. But you can equally well, and with just as much justification, define yourself not only as what you do voluntarily, but also what you do involuntarily. That's you too. Do you beat your heart or don't you? Or does it just happen to you? And if you define yourself as the works, then nobody's imposing on you. 
You're not a victim. You're doing it. Plus, you can't explain how you do it in words because words are too clumsy. And it takes too long to say. You get bored with it. But actually, then you can say, with, with gusto, I am responsible for this life. Whether comedy or tragedy, I did it. And it seems to me that that is a basis for behavior and going on, which is more fundamentally joyous and profitable and uh, great than defining ourselves as miserable victims or sinners or what have you. I was discussing an alternative myth to the ceramic and fully automatic models of the universe. I'll call the dramatic myth. The idea that life as we experience it's a big act and that behind this big act is the player. And uh, the player, or the self as it's called in Hindu philosophy, the Atman, is you. Only you are playing hide and seek, since that is the essential game that's going on. It's the game of games, it's the basis of all games, hide and seek. And so since you're playing hide and seek, you are deliberately, although you can't admit this, or won't admit it, you are deliberately forgetting who you really are, or what you really are, and the knowledge that your essential self is the foundation of the universe, the ground of being, as Tillich calls it, is something you have as what the Germans call a Hintergedanke. A Hintergedanke is a thought way, way, way in the back of your mind, way back here somewhere. Something that you know deep down, but can't admit. So, in a way then, in, in order to bring this to the front, in order to know that that is the case, you have to be kitted out of your game. You see, the problem is this. We identify in our experience a differentiation between what we do and what happens to us. We have a certain number of actions that we define as voluntary. And we feel in control of those. And then over against that, there is uh, all those things that are involuntary. But the dividing line between these two is very arbitrary. Because, for example, when you uh, move your hand, you feel that you decide whether to open it or to close it. But then ask yourself, how do you decide? When you decide to open your hand, do you first decide to decide? You don't, do you? You just decide, and how do you do that? And if you don't know how you do it, is it voluntary or involuntary? Let's consider breathing. You can feel that you breathe deliberately. You can control your breath. But when you don't think about it, it goes on. Is it voluntary or involuntary? So, we come to have a very arbitrary definition of self. That much of my activity which I feel I do. And that then doesn't include breathing most of the time. It doesn't include the heartbeats. It doesn't include uh, the activity of the glands. It doesn't include digestion. It doesn't include how you shape your bones, circulate your blood. Do you or do you not do these things? Now, if you get with yourself and you find out that you are all of yourself, a very strange thing happens. You find that your body knows that you are one with the universe. 
In other words, that the so-called involuntary circulation of your blood is one continuous process with the stars shining. If you find out that it's you who circulates your blood, you will at the same moment find out that you are shining the sun. Because your physical organism is one continuous process with everything else that's going on. Just as the waves are continuous with the ocean, your body is continuous with the total energy system of the cosmos. And it's all you. Only you're playing the game that you're only this bit of it. But as I tried to explain, there are in physical reality no such things as separate events. So then, remember also when I tried to work towards a definition of omnipotence. Omnipotence is not knowing how everything is done, it's just doing it. You don't have to translate it into language. Look, supposing when you got up in the morning, you had to switch your brain on. And you had to think and do as a deliberate process, waking up all the circuits that you need for active life during the day. Why, you'd never get done. Because you have to do all those things at once. How can a centipede control a hundred legs at once? Because it doesn't think about it. And so in the same way, you are unconsciously performing all the various activities of your organism. Only unconsciously isn't a good word because it sounds sort of dead. Superconsciously would be better. Give it a plus rather than a minus. Because what a consciousness is, is simply a sort of specialized form of awareness. When you uh, look around the room, you are conscious of as much as you can notice. And you see an enormous number of things which you don't notice. If, for example, I look at a girl here and somebody asks me later, what was she wearing? I may not know, although I've seen, because I didn't attend. But I was aware, you see. And perhaps if I could, uh, under hypnosis, be asked this question, where I would get my conscious attention out of the way be through being in the hypnotic state, I could recall what dress she was wearing. So then, just think about that. Children think about it. It's one of the great wonders of life. What will it be like to go to sleep and never wake up? And if you think long enough about that, something will happen to you. You will find out, among other things, that uh, it'll pose the next question to you. What was it like to wake up after having never gone to sleep? That was when you were born. You see, you, you can't have an experience of nothing. Nature abhors a vacuum. So after you're dead, the only thing that can happen is the same experience or the same sort of experience as when you were born. In other words, we all know very well that after people die, other people are born. And they're all you. Only you can only experience it one at a time. Everybody is I. You all know you are you. And wheresoever beings exist throughout all galaxies, it doesn't make any difference. You are all of them. And when they come into being, that's you coming into being. You know that very well. Only you don't have to remember the past in the same way you don't have to think about how you work your thyroid gland or whatever else it is in your organism. You don't have to know how to shine the sun. You just do it. Like you breathe. Isn't it, doesn't it really astonish you that you are this fantastically complex thing? And that you're doing all of this and you never had any education in how to do it? You never learned, but you're this miracle? Well, the point is that from a strictly physical, scientific standpoint, this organism is a continuous energy with everything else that's going on. 
And if I am my foot, I am the sun. Only we've got this little partial view, we've got the idea that no, I'm just something in this body. The ego. That's a joke. The ego is nothing other than the focus of conscious attention. It's like a radar on a ship. The radar on a ship is a troubleshooter. Is there anything in the way? And conscious attention is a designed function of the brain to scan the environment, like a radar does. And note for any troublemaking changes. But if you identify yourself with your troubleshooter, then naturally you define yourself as being in a perpetual state of anxiety. And the moment we cease to identify with the ego and become aware that we are the whole organism, you realize the, as the first thing how harmonious it all is. Because your organism is a miracle of harmony. All this thing functioning together. Even those corpuscles and uh, creatures that are fighting each other in the bloodstream and eating each other up. If they weren't doing that, you wouldn't be healthy. So what is discord at one level of your being is harmony at a higher level. And you begin to realize that and you begin to be aware too that the discords of your life and the discords of people's life, which are a fight at one level, at a higher level of the universe, are healthy and harmonious. And you suddenly realize that everything that you are and do is at that level as magnificent and as free of any blemish as the patterns in waves. The markings in marble, the way a cat moves, and that this world is really okay can't be anything else because otherwise it couldn't exist. But the reality underneath physical existence, or which really is physical existence, because in my philosophy there's no difference between the physical and the spiritual. These are absolutely out of date categories. It's all process. It isn't stuff on the one hand and form on the other. It's just, it is pattern. Life is pattern. It is a dance of energy. So. I will never invoke spooky knowledge. Uh, that is to say that I've had a private revelation or that I have sensory vibrations going on a plane which you don't have. Everything is standing right out in the open. It's just a question of how you look at it. So you do discover when you realize this, the most extraordinary thing to me that I never cease to be flabbergasted at whenever it happens to me. Some people will use a symbolism of the relationship of God to the universe, wherein God is a brilliant light, only somehow veiled, hiding underneath all these forms that you see as you look around you. So far, so good. But the truth is funnier than that. It is that you are looking right at the brilliant light now, that the experience you are having, which you call ordinary everyday consciousness, pretending you're not it, that experience is exactly the same thing as it. There's no difference at all. And when you find that out, you laugh yourself silly. <laughs> That's the great discovery. In other words, when you really start to see things, and you look at an old paper cup and you go into the nature of what it is to see what vision is or what smell is or what touches you realize that that vision of the paper cup is the brilliant light of the cosmos nothing could be brighter ten thousand suns couldn't be brighter only they are hidden in the sense that all the points of the infinite light are so tiny when you see them in the cup. They don't blow your eyes out. But it is actually, see, the source of all light is in the eye. If there were no eyes in this world, the sun would not be light. 
You evoke light out of the universe. In the same way, you, by virtue of having a soft skin, evoke hardness out of wood. Wood is only hard in relation to a soft skin. It's your eardrum that evokes noise out of the air. You, by being this organism, call into being the whole universe of light and color and hardness and heaviness and everything, you see? Uh, but in, in the mythology that we've sold ourselves on during the end of the 19th century, when people discovered how big the universe was, and that we live on a little planet in a solar system on the edge of a galaxy, which is a minor galaxy, everybody thought, ah, oh, we're really unimportant after all. God isn't there and doesn't love us, and nature doesn't give a damn. And uh, we put ourselves down, you see. But actually, it's this little funny microbe, tiny thing, crawling on this little planet, that's way out somewhere, who has the ingenuity, by nature of this magnificent organic structure, to evoke the whole universe out of what would otherwise be mere quanta. There's jazz going on. But do you see, this little... So the moment you start practicing yoga, or praying, or meditating, or indulging in some sort of spiritual cultivation, you are getting in your own way. The Buddha said, we suffer because we desire. If you can give up desire, you won't suffer. But he didn't say that as the last word. He said that as the opening step of a dialogue. Because the, if, he, if you say that to someone, they're going to come back after a while and say, yes, but I'm now desiring not to desire. And so the Buddha will answer, well, at last you're beginning to understand the point. Because you can't give up desire, why would you try to do that? It's already desire. So in the same way, you say, oh, you ought to be unselfish, or to give up your ego, let go, relax. Why do you want to do that? Just because it's another way of beating the game, isn't it? The moment you see you hypothesize that you are different from the universe, you want to get one up on it. But if you try to get one up on the universe and you're in competition with it, it means you don't understand you are it. You think there's a real difference between self and other, but self, what you call yourself and what you call other, are mutually necessary to each other, like back and front. They're really one. But just as a magnet polarizes itself in north and south, but it's all one magnet, so experience polarizes itself as self and other, but it's all one. So if you try to make the North Pole get the mastery of it, or the South Pole get the mastery of the North Pole, you show you don't know what's going on. A guru or teacher who wants to get this across to somebody, because he knows it himself, and when you know it, you know, you like others to see it too. So what he does is he gets you into being ridiculous harder and more assiduously than usual. In other words, if you are in a contest with the universe, he's going to stir up that contest until it becomes ridiculous. And so he sets you such tasks as saying, now of course in order to be a true person, you must give up yourself, be unselfish. So the Lord sits, uh, steps down out of heaven and says, first and great commandment is, thou shalt love the Lord thy God. You must love me. Well, that's a double bind. You can't love on purpose. You can't be sincere purposely. It's like trying not to think of a green elephant while taking medicine. <laughs> But if a person really tries to do it, so, you know, this is where Christianity is rich, you should be very sorry for your sins. And though everybody knows they're not, but they think they ought to be, and so they go around trying to be penitent, or trying to be humble. And they know the more assiduously they practice it, the phonier and phonier the whole thing gets. And so in this way, 
It's a, what it's called a, the technique of reductio ad absurdum. If you think you have a problem, you see, and that you're an ego and that you're in difficulty, the answer that the Zen master makes to you is show me your ego. I want to see this thing that has a problem. When Bodhidharma, the legendary founder of Zen, came to China, a disciple came to him and said, I have no peace of mind. Please pacify my mind. And Bodhidharma said, bring out your mind here before me and I'll pacify it. Well, he said, when I look for it, I can't find it. So Bodhidharma said, there, it's pacified. See, because when you look for your own mind, that is to say your own particularized center of being, which is separate from everything else, you won't be able to find it. But the only way you'll know it isn't there is if you look for it hard enough to find out that it isn't there. And so everybody says, all right, know yourself, look within, find out who you are. Because the harder you look, you won't be able to find it. And then you'll realize that it isn't there at all. There isn't a separate you. Your mind is what there is. Everything. But the only way to find that out is to persist in the state of delusion as hard as possible. That's one way. I don't say the only way, but it is one way. And so almost all spiritual disciplines, meditations, prayers, etc., etc., are ways of persisting in folly, doing resolutely and consistently what you're doing already. So if a person believes that the earth is flat, you can't talk him out of that. He knows it's flat. Look out of the window and see it. Obviously, it looks flat. So the only way to convince him that it isn't is to say, well, let's go and find the edge. And in order to find the edge, you've got to be very careful not to walk in circles. And you'll never find it that way. So we've got to go consistently in a straight line, due west, along the same line of latitude. And eventually, when we get back to where we started from, you've convinced the guy that the earth is round. But that's the, that's the only way that will that'll teach him. Because people can't be talked out of illusions. Well, now, there is another possibility, however. But this is more difficult to describe. Let's say uh, we, we take as the basic supposition, which is the thing that one sees in the experience of satori or, or awakening or whatever you want to call it, that this now moment in which I'm talking, you are listening, is eternity. That although we have somehow conned ourselves into the notion that this moment is rather ordinary, and that we may not feel very well, and that uh, we're sort of vaguely frustrated and worried and so on, and that it ought to be changed. This is it. So you don't need to do anything at all. But the difficulty about explaining that is that don't, you, you mustn't try not to do anything, because that's doing something. And how to explain that? Because there's nothing to explain. It's the, it, it, it is the way it is now, you see. And if you understand that, it will automatically wake you up. That's why Zen teachers use shock treatment to uh, sometimes while they hit people or shout at them or cr create a sudden surprise. Because it is that jolt that suddenly brings you here. See, there's no road to here, because you're already there. And if you ask me, how am I going to get here? It'll be like the famous story of the American tourist in England, who asked some yokel the way to Upper Tottenham, a little village. The yokel scratched his head and he said, well, sir, I do know where it is, but if I were you, I wouldn't start from here. <laughs> <laughs> so, you see, when you ask, how do I attain the knowledge of God? How do I attain nirvana, liberation? 
All I can say is it's the wrong question. Why do you want to attain it? Because the very fact that you're wanting to attain it is the only thing that prevents you from getting there. You already have it. But of course, uh, it's, it's up to you. It's your privilege to pretend that you don't. That's your game. That's your life game. That's what makes you think you're an ego. And uh, when you want to wake up, you will. Just like that. If you're not awake, it shows you don't want to. You're, you're still playing the high part of the game. You're still, as it were, the, the, the self, pretending it's not the self. That's what you want to do. So you see, in that way too, you're already there. When you understand this, a funny thing happens. And some people uh, misinterpret it. You will discover, as this happens, that the distinction between voluntary and involuntary behavior disappears. You will realize that what you describe as things under your own will feel exactly the same as things going on outside you. You watch other people moving and you know you're doing that. Just like you're breathing or circulating your blood. If you don't understand what's going on, you're liable to get crazy at this point and to feel that you are God in the Jehovah sense. Say that you actually have power over other people so that you could alter what they're doing and that you are omnipotent in a very crude, literal kind of Bible sense, you see. And uh, a lot of people feel that and they go crazy. That put them away. They think they're Jesus Christ and that everybody ought to fall down and worship. That's only they got their wires crossed. They haven't been able to, this experience happened to them, but they don't know how to interpret it. So be careful of that. Jung calls it inflation. People who get the holy man syndrome, that uh, I suddenly discovered that I'm the Lord and that I'm above good and evil and so on, and that, that uh, therefore I start giving myself airs and graces. But the point is everybody else is too. If you discover that you're that, then you ought to know that everybody else is. Well, for example, let, let's see how in, in other ways you might realize this. Most people think when they open their eyes and look around that what they are seeing is outside. It seems, doesn't it, that you are behind your eyes and that behind the eyes there is a blank that you can't see at all. Turn around and you see something else in front of you. But behind the eyes there seems to be something that has no color. It isn't dark, it isn't light, it's just, uh, it's there from a tactile standpoint. You can feel it with your fingers, although you don't get inside it. But what is that behind your eyes, you see? Well, actually, when you look out there and see all these people and, and things sitting around, that's how it feels inside your head. The color of this room is back here in the nervous system where the optical nerves are at the back of the head. It's in there. It's what you're experiencing. What you see out here is a neurological experience. Now, if that hits you, and you feel sensuously that that's so, you may think that then, then therefore, the external world is all inside my skull. But you've got to correct that with the thought that your skull is also in the external world. So you suddenly begin to feel, well, wow, what a kind of a situation is this? It's inside me, and I'm inside it, and it's inside me, and I'm inside it. But that's the way it is. This is the, what you could call transaction, rather than interaction, between the individual and the world. Just like, for example, in buying and selling, there cannot be an act of buying unless it's simultaneously an act of selling and vice versa. So the relationship between the organism and the environment is transactional. The environment grows the organism, and in turn, the organism creates the environment. The 
organism turns the sun to light, but it requires there to be an environment containing a sun for there to be an organism at all. The answer to it is simply they're all one process. And uh, <clears throat> it isn't that organisms by chance came into this world put it rather that this world is the sort of environment which grows organs. It was that way from the beginning. Just in the same way for I mean, the organisms may in time have arrived in the seed or out of the seed later than the beginning of the seed. But from the moment it went bang in the beginning, that's the way it started. Organisms like us, us sitting here, were involved in you see, look here, let's take the, the propagation of an electric current. I can have a, an electric current running through a wire that goes all the way around the Earth. And uh, here we have our power source, and here we have a switch. All right. Here's the positive pole. Here's the negative pole. Now. Before that switch closes, there is n the current doesn't exactly behave like water in a pipe. There isn't current here waiting to jump the gap as soon as the switch is closed. The current doesn't even start until the switch is closed from the positive pole. It never starts unless the point of arrival is there. Now, it'll take an interval for that current to get going and uh, circuit sort of going all the way around the Earth. It's a long run. But the, but the finishing point has to be closed before it will even start from the beginning. In a similar way, although uh, in, in the development of any physical system, there may be billions of years between the creation of the most primitive form of energy and then the arrival of intelligent life. That billions of years is just the same thing as the trip of the current around the wire. It takes a little time. But it's already implied. It takes time for an acorn to turn into an oak. But the oak is already implied in the acorn. So in any lump of rock floating about in space, there is implicit human intelligence. Sometimes somehow, somewhere. They all go together. So don't differentiate yourself and stand off against this and say, I am a living organism in a world made of a lot of dead junk, rocks and stuff. It all goes together. Those rocks are just as much you as your fingernails. You need rocks. What are you going to stand on? What I think, you know, awakening really involves is a re-examination of our common sense. We've got all sorts of ideas built into us which seem unquestioned, obvious. And our speech reflects them. The commonest phrases face the facts as if they were outside you. As if uh, life was something you simply encountered as a foreigner. Face the facts. Our common sense has been rigged, you see, so that we feel strangers and aliens in this world. And this is terribly plausible. Simply because it's what we're used to. That's the only reason. But when you really start questioning this, you say, is that the way I have to assume life is? I know everybody does, but does that make it true? 
It doesn't necessarily. It ain't necessarily so. And so then you, as, as you question this basic assumption that underlies our culture, you find you get a new kind of common sense. It becomes absolutely obvious to you that you are continuous with the universe. For example, people used to believe that the people who lived in the antipodes would fall off. And that was scary. But then when somebody sailed around the world, and we all got used to it, and now we, we travel around in jet planes and everything, we have no problem about feeling that the Earth is globular. None whatever. We got used to it. So in the same way, Einstein's relativity theories, the curvature of the propagation of light, that began to bother people when Einstein started talking like that. But now we're all used to it. Well, in a few years, it will be a matter of common sense to very many people that they're one with the universe. It'll be so simple. And then maybe, if that happens, we shall be in a position to handle our technology with more sense. With love instead of with hate for our environment. Thank you.